Tonight, the Lord's got something special for us, certainly. We're in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 11, as we've been going through the words. That's really what the book is known. It's just, it's the words of the Lord. And what it is, is Moses, now on the edge of the promised land, the last month of his life, takes time to write down everything that God has told him to tell the children of Israel. He tells them, and then he leaves them this record. This record covers a lot of things that we've been studying since we left Egypt back in the book of Exodus and Leviticus and Numbers <laughs> and here in Deuteronomy. And so what we're doing is we're just recovering or going over for that next generation the things that the first generation learned in the school of hard knocks. Or didn't learn. Yeah, correct. <laughs> that maybe we can learn from the mistakes of those who have gone before us. No. So here we come into chapter 11. Now, I had asked you previously, read ahead, because I'm going to move kind of quick. We, like I said, we've already done this. Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers. And so most of this, if you want to go and dig in and get some more details, that's great. I just want to make sure we get the general idea here. So, chapter 11, therefore, this comes after God has given through Moses the law and the essence of the law to fear the Lord, to walk in His ways, to love Him, to serve Him, to keep His commandments. And how God has done all of these wonderful things for you. He's delighted in you. He's brought you into this wonderful land that the strangers did everything for you. And you just move into the houses and take over the orchards. And I did all of this stuff for you. And I've given you the, the, my, my precepts, my directives, my decrees that you could live a wonderful, blessed life. Therefore... You shall love the Lord your God and keep his charge, his statutes, his judgments, and his commandments always. And this is imperative. This is a command. You shall. Not you might or it's a suggestion. God is telling them. You're my people. I've done all these things for you. Your response will be this. As Jesus would say in John chapter 14. If you love me, keep my commandments. This is... Just how we express our love, how we reflect the love he's poured into us back to him. He says in verse 2, Know today that I do not speak with your children who have not known and who have not seen the chastening of the Lord your God, his greatness and his mighty hand and his outstretched arm. So he says, you're going to know this. These things I'm, not t I'm telling you, it's not like this is the first time You've been there, you've done that, you got the t-shirt, and your job is going to pass them on to the next generation. Verse 3, you've seen his, his greatness, his mighty hand, his outstretched arm, his signs, and his acts, which he did in the midst of Egypt, to Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, and to all his land. Granted, there are some people here that have been born in the wilderness over the past 40 years since they left Egypt. But a great deal of the people he's speaking to right now and addressing, they were there. They remember. Verse 4, what he did to the army of Egypt, to their horses and their chariots, how he made the waters of the Red Sea overflow as they pursued you, and how the Lord has destroyed them to this day. What he did for you in the wilderness until you came to this place, and what he did to Dathan and Abiram, or Abiram the sons of Eliab, the son of Reuben, how the earth opened its mouth and swallowed them up, their households, their tents, and their substance that was in their possession in the midst of Israel. We read about that back in number 16. The rebellion of Korah and these leaders of that rebellion. Verse 7. But your eyes have seen every great act which the Lord did. Therefore, you shall keep every commandment which I command you today, that you may be strong and go in and possess the land which you cross over to possess, and that you may prolong your days in the land which the Lord swore to give to your fathers, to them and their descendants, a land flowing with milk and honey. 
For the land which you go to possess is not like the land of Egypt from which you have come, where you sowed your seed and watered it by foot as, veg as a vegetable garden. Along the river Nile, they would irrigate with pumps, and they would use their feet to pump the water up into the culverts or the aqueducts, the canals that they made. But that's not what it's going to be like in this new land. There's no big river running through it that you're going to irrigate everything. But the land, verse 11, which you cross over to possess is a land of hills and valleys, which drinks water from the rain of heaven. A land for which the Lord your God cares. The eye of the Lord your God are always on it from the beginning of the year to the very end of the year. And it shall be that if you earnestly obey my commandments, which I command you today, to love the Lord your God and serve him with all your heart and with all your soul, then I will give you the rain for your land in its season, the early rain and the latter rain, that you may gather in your grain your new wine and your oil, and I will send grass in your fields and for your livestock, that you may eat and be filled. Take heed to yourselves, lest your heart be deceived, and you turn aside and serve other gods and worship them. Lest the Lord's anger be aroused against you, and he shut up the heavens, so that there be no rain in the land, and yield no produce, and you perish quickly from the good land which the Lord God is giving you. Or the Lord God is give, the Lord is giving you, pardon me. And so we see looking backwards to what God has done, looking forwards it crossed into the promised land, what the Lord is going to do. And then he goes into verse 18. Well, I'm sorry. I had a little side note here. I wanted to bring it in. I'm trying to go fast, so I probably shouldn't give too much extra de detail. But for us, Christians, today, a very similar thing. In the book of Hebrews, fantastic book, in Hebrews chapter 2, as the author of Hebrews has opened up that, that Jesus is more excellent than the prophets, than the angels, and all of these things, we read in chapter 2, verse 1 of Hebrews, Therefore we must give the more earnest heed to the things we have heard, lest we drift away. And that's basically what we've just read. Look at all the things I did for you in the wilderness. Look at all the things I'm going to do for you there. But... You need to obey me. You need to, you need to reflect the love I'm pouring on you back to me. We must give the more earnest heed to the things we have heard, lest we drift away. And I've taught Hebrews a number of times. I love this outline. Fundamentally, we go through chapter 2, drifting. In chapter 3, at verse 12, we're warned about departing from the living God. In chapter 6, verse 6, we began a section with a warning not to fall away. In chapter 10, verse 29, we're warned not to insult the Holy Spirit. And in chapter 12, verse 25, to not refuse he who called you. And we have these major warnings to Hebrews, to Christians today, in light of who God is and what he's done for you, what he's promised to do don't drift, don't depart, don't fall away, don't insult God, and don't refuse God. And this is where the children of Israel now stand on the edge of the promised land. Verse 18, Therefore you shall lay up these words of mine in your heart and in your soul, and bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontlets before your eyes. You shall teach them to your children, speaking of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise up. And you shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates, that your days and the days of your children may be multiplied in the land of which the Lord swore to your fathers to give them, like the days of the heavens above the earth. This sounds a lot like what we just read in chapter 6, verses 4 um, through 9, the great Shema. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God. And how many times do we need to see this repeated? You should love, love, love. God loves you, you love him back. And, and people often look at the Old Testament, oh, that's that, the law, it's severe, it's, it's, you know, it's condemning. And it's like, have you really read it? It's, it's, it's full of love. 
That's the whole point of it. Verse 22. For if you carefully keep all these commandments, which I command you to do, to love the Lord your God, to walk in all his ways, and to hold fast to him. So this is conditional. Okay, you need to love him. You need to walk with him and hold on to him. Verse 23, then the Lord will drive out all these nations from before you, and you will dispossess greater and mightier nations than yourselves. Every place on which the sole of your foot treads shall be yours, from the wilderness and Lebanon, from the river, the river Euphrates, even to the western sea shall be your territory. No man shall be able to stand against you. The Lord your God will put the dread of you and the fear of you upon all the land where you tread, just as he said to you. We're going to see this repeated again when Moses commissions Joshua. And he says, everywhere you walk, it's going to be yours. And he, de he defines this area, the promised land. And from the Mediterranean Sea to the Euphrates, Euphrates River, up north of Israel into what we would call Lebanon today, this whole area, it's about 300,000 square miles. At the zenith of the empire of Israel, the nation, under Solomon, its largest it ever got was 30,000 square miles. They only ever conquered a tenth of it. And yet God promised, if you will obey me, everywhere you take the sole of your foot, I'm giving it to you. Okay? So we kind of see some of this unfolding as we go. It says, verse 26, Behold, behold I set before you today a blessing and a curse. We're going to see that repeated again in chapters 27 and 28. And then in, verse 30, in chapter 31, God's going to close out with this same thing. Behold, I set before you today. Here's an option. I'm putting it right in front of you. A blessing or a curse? You get to pick. Okay? A blessing or a curse. Um, verse 27. The blessing, if you obey the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you today. And the curse, if you do not obey the commandments of the Lord your God. But turn aside from the way which I command you today to go after other gods which you have not known. Something kind of interesting in this blessing and curse, it's the same word. It's just, what do you do with it? The word of God, all, all his words are yes and amen. But if you reject his word, you do not obey his word, his word becomes a curse. He's already told you, this is the way to success. If you say, not interested, that way to success becomes a curse to you. You, you reject it, and, and therefore, it's all on you. Um, verse 29. Now it shall be, when the Lord your God has brought you into the land which you go to possess, that you shall put the blessing on Mount Gerizim and the curse on Mount Ebal. They, are they not on the other side of the Jordan toward the setting sun to the west, in the land of the Canaanites who dwell in the plain opposite Gilgal, beside the terebinth trees of Moray? For you will cross over the Jordan and go in to possess the land which your Lord your God is giving you, and you will possess it and dwell in it. And you shall be careful to observe all the statutes and judgments which I have set before you today. It's interesting. He says, isn't, isn't it where I told you it would be there in Gilgal? Right? These two mountains? I'm like, how would I know that? Well, if you've got your scriptures, this is the place Jacob dug as well. This is part of the... The inheritance, this is part of their heritage. This is part of all the stories that they would have been told from their ancestors about God and the promised land. He says, it's there, you can check it out for yourself. Not only were we going to see it in the book of Joshua, where they are in fact going to go to these two mountains, they're going to split the 12 tribes into two pieces. Six will go up on Mount Ebal, six will go up on Mount Gerizim, and then they'll read from the law out of the blessings and the other side of the valley they'll read from the law out of the curses and then God will say well, I want you to set up a stone and whitewash it and write all these words on it that you have confirmed today just like I told you I would do fun for us as Christians there's a story in the gospel of John where Jesus goes through Samaria to get to Jerusalem which is not the normal way that Jews would travel. They would avoid that area. But it would take them right past Jacob's well. You know this story. It's the woman of the well. 
in uh, John chapter 4. And he meets this woman and asks for water. And they get into this conversation. And Jesus would say, if you knew who I was, you'd ask for me living water. You'd never thirst again. And they kind of get into this back and forth conversation. Well, in verse 19, uh, the woman comes around to recognize him. She says, the woman said to him, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain. Right? This is where Mount Gerizim and Mount Ebal are. Our fathers worked on, worshipped on this mountain. And you Jews say that Jerusalem is the place where one ought to worship. Jesus said to her, Woman, Believe me, the hour is coming when you will neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship. Uh, we know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour is coming, and now is, when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such to worship Him. God is spirit, and those who worship Him must worship in spirit and and truth. Okay? And so, Jesus would tell his followers, us, that it's really not about the location or the place. Truly, and we're going to see as we go through the Old Testament, God is going to put his name on Jerusalem. That's the place I choose to put my name. Um, we'll read that in 2 Kings. But here... God is telling him, when you get there, I want you to go ahead and, and remember what I told you. I'm giving you this option, and it's going to be a blessing to you. But if you reject it, it'll, it'll go rotten on you. It will spoil on you. It will become a curse to you. Um, verse 12, and in this, God is going to say, this is where I want you to worship. Okay, so the Jews get a special place, okay, but, but we're going to be careful what we interpret out of this. Verse 12, chapter 12. These are the statutes and judgments which you shall be careful to observe in the land which the Lord God of your fathers is giving you to possess all the days that you live on the earth. Chapter 12, verse 2. You shall utterly destroy all the places where the nations which you shall dis dispossess serve their gods on the high mountains and on the hills and under every green tree. And you shall, shall destroy their altars break their sacred pillars, and burn their wooden images with fire. You shall cut down the carved images of their gods and destroy their names in that place. You shall not worship the Lord your God with such things. And this is what they're to do. I don't want you going into the ancient temples that were there. This was common. When one nation would conquer another nation, that... A lot of the temples were some of the be greatest pieces of architecture in these conquered nations, and they'd set up camp there, and they'd go, well, we'll just take this old building and turn it into our new worship place. And God says, that's not what I want. I want you to tear those things down and start fresh with me. And it's kind of a picture for us of to what we're supposed to do. In 1 Corinthians 3, 16, we read, Do you not know that you are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwells in you. And when we start walking in the Spirit, walking in the promise, in the promised land that God is giving us to conquer, one of the first steps we need to do is make sure that we tear down all the old idols, all the old places we used to go to worship instead of God. That's, that's what he's basically commanding here. He goes on to say, verse 6, there you shall take your burnt offerings, your sacrifices, your tithes, the heave offerings of your hand, your vowed offerings, your freewill offerings, the firstborn of your herds and flocks. And there you shall eat before the Lord your God, and you shall rejoice in all which you have put to your hand, you and your households in which the Lord God has blessed you. You shall not at all do as we are doing here today, every man doing whatever is right in his own eyes. And in fact... After the book of Deuteronomy comes the book of Judges, then the book of Joshua, or the book of Joshua, then the book of Judges, and this is the last verse of the book of Judges. This is exactly what they're going to end up doing, just as they were doing that day, every man doing what is right in his own eyes. But God is laying out, 
this is how you can walk with me and receive all the blessings to make sure that they know this, right? This idea of doing everything that's right in his own eyes is alive and well today. We call it moral relativism. What's right for you might not be right for me. What's true for you might not be right for me or true for me. And it's absolutely bogus. It's false. There are absolute truths. It's funny, that, not funny, but there was an article Daryl sent to me just recently, a day or two ago, but the World Economic Forum with Klaus Schwab, they have ordered governments to rewrite their Bibles, taking out all the false news, all the fake news references to God. Oh, that's, is that true? Yeah. They, it's not, that's what they said to do. A, the World Economic Forum is not my boss. Right, amen to that. Okay? <laughs> but they're trying to be. And right. it's kind of the golden rule. He who has the gold makes the rules. Right. They do control the purse strings of planet Earth. And if they say jump, you say... How high? You say no. <laughs> no, I, I know, you, I was baiting you. I led you on there. But, <laughs> but that's where we sit tonight, this Wednesday, 2023. This is the, the world we live in. It's coming right off the pages of the Bible here. Okay? Maybe there's something for us to learn. Let's, let's pay attention. Verse 9. <laughs> Every man is doing whatever is right in his own eyes, for as yet you have not come to the rest and the inheritance which the Lord God has given you. That place of rest. Okay? Now, it's, kind of, it's called a place of rest, but it's going to be 14 years of fighting battles and apportioning the land. It's going to be blood, sweat, and tears. And God calls it rest. But in His promises... Everywhere you put the sole of your foot, in faith and obedience to God, even though it's blood, sweat, and tears, it's rest. Because you're in Him. And you're in His will. And you will have a peace that passes understanding. You will have hope. You will have joy. You will have orchards. You will have places to bring your offerings. You'll have family. Your generations will be blessed. It is a place of rest. Even though it involves work. Something I think a lot of people don't study the Bible enough to understand heaven. And there's a lot that the Bible says about heaven. But you do know in heaven, you will work. You will have jobs. There will be things to do. Well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful in a few things. I will give you many. You know, I'm going to give you a lot more than you had here. And you're going to be like, whistle while you work, right? This is great. Thank you, Jesus. Verse 10, But when you cross over the Jordan and dwell in the land which the Lord God is giving you to inherit, and he gives you rest from all your enemies round about, so that you dwell in safety, then there will be the place where the Lord your God chooses to make his name abide. There you shall bring all that I command you, your burnt offerings, your sacrifices, your tithes, the heave offerings of your hand, all the choice offerings, which with... Uh, choice offerings which you vow to the Lord and you shall rejoice before the Lord your God you and your sons and your daughters your male and female servants and the Levite who is within your gates since he has no portion nor inheritance with you um, and so he says I want you to come and we're going to worship I'm going to tell you where to worship not in those old pagan places not in the old style the old things have died all things have become new. We're going to do it my way. Yahweh. You're going to love it. It's going to be great. Okay? Verse 13. Take heed to yourselves that you do not offer your burnt offerings in every place that you see. You can't just make up your own religion. You can't just... And this is so common. I mean, huh, there's hardly a week that goes by that I don't end up talking with somebody who is telling me, well, I'm kind of a... Buddhist Muslim, or I'm a humanist, whatever, you know, fill in the blank, and you're like, you can't make up religions, okay? You just, it's against the rules, okay? 
Now, there is only one legitimate religion ever given on earth, and that is Judaism. That is the tabernacle, the feasts, the substitutionary atonement, and it is fulfilled in the Lamb of God, Jesus Christ. Everything else is counterfeit. Everything else are idols and false gods. But people are going to do it. Every man does what's right in his own eyes. This is how I worship, and I'm all good with God. Really? And how do you know this? Where do you get, where do you get this? Anyways, tangent, don't have time for that. Okay. Uh, verse 14, But in the place which the Lord chooses... In one of your tribes, there you shall offer your burnt offerings, and there you should do all I command you. Okay, and we're going to see in 1 Kings 11 uh, that Solomon's going to establish the temple in Jerusalem, and um, it'll get ratified many times over, where God says, this is the place I've put my name. You can come here. But at this point in time, they still have the Shekinah glory. They still have the pillar of uh, cloud by day and fire by night. It will end next month after we get out of the book of Deuteronomy. They'll, the manna will cease, the Shekinah glory will cease, but they'll still have the tabernacle. And as God would guide them through their leaders, Joshua or wherever, he said, this is the place I want you to come and worship me. Just to keep make sure that everything is done decently, and in order that there is a proper way to approach me. I am a holy God. Okay? Um, I am a consuming fire. And you don't want to do this um, just any old which way. It's not how you enter into the presence of God Almighty. Okay? Do it right so that um, not only will you receive the blessings... But we'll, we'll enter into a real relationship that way it's designed. Okay, Verse 15, However you may slaughter and eat and eat within all your gates, whatever your heart desires, according to the blessing of the Lord your God, which he has given you, of the unclean and clean you may eat of it, of the gazelle and the deer alike. So whatever domestic animals or whatever you kill in the field, you can eat all that, but if you want to do this as an offering or a sacrifice, then you need to come and do it the right way. But... Other than that, go ahead. You know, enjoy the bounty of the land. Um, he says, verse 16, Only you shall not eat the blood, you shall pour it on the earth like water. You may not eat within your gates the tithe of your grain or your new wine, your oil, your firstborn of your herd or your flock, any of your offerings which you vow of the freewill offerings or the heave offerings in your hand. You can't just set up your own uh, little um, altar and just do church in your house, and you're good. This is what he's saying. And again, that doesn't mean you can't worship at home. We can't worship at home. Like we just read, we are the temple of the living God. He dwells within us. But these are directives towards the children of Israel, his own peculiar people. He's helping them avoid all the pitfalls of all these other heathen pagan nations in the lands which they're going to avoid. So he's putting a big safety net around them. That's basically what's happening here. Um, verse 18, But you must eat them before the Lord your God in the place where the Lord your God chooses. You and your son, your daughter, your male servant, female servant, the Levite who's within your gates, you shall rejoice before the Lord your God in all which he puts to your hands. And if you've been paying attention, he says rejoice, rejoice, rejoice. rejoice. Again I say, rejoice. rejoice, okay? This is not a burden. This is not grudging. This is not an obligation. It's date night. It's a moen. As we read in Genesis chapter 1, verse uh, 14, I put the sun, the moon, and the stars in the sky for, you know, when it's time for us to have a date. You know when it's the Sabbath. You know when it's the new moon. You know when we have all these special holidays. And you're going to come, and you're going to bring something, and we're going to hang out together and just enjoy each other. And so it's, it's supposed to be fun. It's joyful. And if you look at the Bible, the number of days off, with all of the uh, holidays and whatnot, it's close to 20% of the year they don't work. They just hang out with God. 
and enjoy feasting with him. Wouldn't you love that? That'd be a pretty good deal, right? Um, but anyways, going on verse 19, take heed to yourself that you do not forsake the Levite as long as you live in your land. He keeps, he keeps bringing this. Oh, and don't forget the Levite. Oh yeah, and don't forget the Levite. Remember, the Levites, they don't get a portion. Okay? So make sure you take care of those who are tasked with serving you. If there's somebody amongst you that is serving you, be mindful. Make sure that they get some of that. You can almost apply this in some ways to even like tipping, you know, especially people we know that make below minimum wage and they're dependent on tips <coughs> to live. It's somewhat of a similar thing. Obviously, the Levites are serving you in your worship of God, okay? But nevertheless, be mindful of those that, you know, are needy around you. And he'll talk about that more as we keep going. Verse 20. When the Lord your God enlarges your border as he's promised you, okay, you're going to grow beyond what you have, and you say, let me eat meat because you long to eat meat, you may eat meat as much meat as your heart desires. If the place where the Lord your God chooses to put his name is too far from you, then you may slaughter from your herd and from your flock, which the Lord has given you, just as I have commanded you, and you may eat within your gates as much as your heart desires. Just as the gazelle and the deer are eaten, so you may eat them. The unclean and the clean alike may eat them. So if it's just a matter of eating animals, whatever, you know, meat, not being a vegan, he says that's perfectly fine. That's basically what he says there. Verse 23, Only be sure that you do not eat the blood, for the blood is the life. You may not eat the life with the meat. We read that in chapter 17. I have given you the, in the blood on the altar to make atonement for your souls. And anything that would be eaten that's an animal must first be drained of its blood. You can't eat the blood in it. That's what the pagans would do. And in it, they think they're acquiring some of the life, life force of those animals or whatever. And it, it's, it's uh, really, it, it comes down to the sanctity of life. Right. Life is precious. And if you're going to take a life and eat that, it, must, it, must, it needs to be done in such a way that it honors life and doesn't desecrate it. Or in some way, make it some kind of a thing where you feel you are now having power over that life. That's a, that's a bad attitude, the wrong way. Um, verse 25, You shall not eat it, that it may go well with you and your children after you, when you do what is right in the sight of the Lord. Only the holy things which you have, and you have uh, your vowed offerings, you shall take and go to the place which the Lord chooses, and you shall offer your burnt offerings, meat and blood, on the altar of the Lord your God, and the blood of your sacrifice shall be poured on the altar of the Lord your God, and you shall eat the meat. Observe and obey all these words which I command you, that it may go well with you and your children after you forever, when you do what is good and right in the sight of the Lord your God. Now, I'm, I know I'm going really fast over a lot of this, but we've read it, we've heard it, we've seen it explained, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and now again in Deuteronomy. But remember, he's writing this down. Up until this point, they would have heard it from Moses or Aaron or the priests or the, the, the people that were around them. But now they have a written record. And that's why we're getting this repeated so much. So I'm not going into the great detail. Um, verse 29, we're going to go into an area about dealing with uh, beware of these idols in these, in these lands. When the Lord your God cuts off from before you the nations which you go to dispossess, and, and you displace them and dwell in their land, take heed that, to yourself that you are not ensnared to follow them after they are destroyed from before you, and that you do not inquire after their God, saying, How do these nations serve their gods? I will also do likewise. Kind of interesting. Kind of curious. I wonder what that's like. I wonder, what that, oh, is there really power in that? I wonder. You know, maybe, maybe we should just go get a Ouija board and see if it really works. No, 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 don't do that. It reminds me of that movie Jumanji. Has anybody seen that movie? With this game, right? And it's like, don't do that. 
It's buried and leave it there. Don't, why would you open up that Pandora's box? That's basically what he's saying. Verse 31, you shall not worship the Lord your God in that way. For every abomination or despicable thing, disgusting thing to the Lord, which he hates, they have done to their gods. For they burn even their sons and daughters in the fire to their gods. Whatever I commanded you, be careful to observe it. You shall not add to it, nor take away from it. Now it's going to go on through here. Chapter 13 is going to do with a lot of idolatry. And really, we could, we could take this and bring it into today in all the cults. And all the isms that are, that are out there. That are parading themselves as if they are like God. If they are like Jesus. If they are like Christianity. Or even if they're just saying, we're not like that. We're a different thing altogether. But they're false. They're not real. And uh, I'm, I'm, I'm tempted just to tell you what's in chapter 13 and not go through all of it because it's a lot of detail. Um, time out. Okay, for just a minute here. As I'm preparing for this, right, I'm looking at what are we going to do? Are we going to go into all this detail or not? If you know me, I like to get into the detail. I love to get in and just look at all of that. And next thing you know, it's like, my, look at the time. Yeah. <laughs> you know? And, and so one of the things I do in preparation, I've got my Bible, I've got my notes, I, I read, I pray, but I also go to some of my teachers that I've, you know, accessed for many years. Um, in preparation for this, one of the teachers I looked at, not all, but one of them was Pastor Chuck Smith. Pastor Chuck Smith, in this particular section of the Bible, in one of his recordings, because he's got many, and he's been through the Bible many times, but he taught chapter 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, and 16. He didn't read near as much as I'm reading. But if he did it, it's okay, isn't it? <laughs> he, he's not the end all and be all, you know. Um, but he is my pastor's pastor, you know. And I, I respect him. I'm going to just take chapter 13. I'm not going to go into a lot of details on this one. Um, it, it, I'm hearing all this groaning. Oh, I'll do it. Okay. It just means you're going to have to listen to this longer. It's going to take more weeks to get done. So, that's all right. Verse 1 of chapter 13. If there arises among you a prophet or a dreamer of dreams, and he gives you a sign or a wonder, and the sign or the wonder which comes to pass, of which he spoke to you, saying, Let us go after other gods which you have not known, and let us serve them, then you shall not listen to the words of that prophet or that dreamer of dreams, for the Lord your God is testing you to know whether you love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. You shall walk after the Lord your God and fear him and keep his commandments and obey his voice. You shall serve him and hold fast. But that prophet or that dreamer of dreams shall be put to death. Because he has spoken in order to turn you away from the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt and redeemed you from the house of bondage to entice you from the way in which the Lord your God commanded you to walk so that you put away the evil from your midst. He's serious. Do not have anything to do with other gods. That's right. That's the second commandment. You may have no other gods, right, before me. It's just, that, that is going to completely break the relationship. And so if people start doing that, you're going you're gonna to find certain things that are just going to mess, mess you up. One of the hallmarks of cults, and you can put this over almost all cults, is they are going to distort and to distance you from the person of Jesus Christ, the Son, and from the Father, and from the Holy Spirit. 
and you'll find this in a variety of cults. I'm not going to name them because it's pretty much everything that isn't Christian, it's a cult. So you can fill in the blanks with your favorite one that you want to learn about. But they're going to distance you from God. They're going to diminish the sun. They're going to demand allegiance. They're going to defy the spirit. They're going to divide the body. And they're going to deceive and damn. This is what they do. And these are all laid out in bits and pieces. Right here, uh, the cults will diminish the sun. If they, they bring you a different God than I've shown you, don't go there. Um, going on, they'll demand allegiance. Okay, Verse 6, they'll divide the body. It says in verse 6, If your brother, the son of your mother, the son of your daughter, the wife of your bosom, or your friend, who is, your own, is as your own soul, secretly entices you, saying, Let us go and serve other gods, which you have not known, neither you nor your fathers, of the gods of the people which are all around you, near to you, or far off from you, from one end of the earth to the other end of the earth. You shall not consent to him, or listen to him, nor shall your eye pity him, nor shall you spare him, or conceal him, but you shall surely kill him. Your hand shall be first against him to put to death, and afterward the hand of the people. Okay, so this is not vigilante justice. This is not taking the law in your own hands, but it is saying that if this comes to your to attention, you need to deal with it strictly, very, very severely. Um, because what they're doing, and, and we see it so much in our neighborhood, especially with certain cults that deny Jesus, at least the God of, the Jesus of the Bible. Mm -hmm. And, and they, they do all kinds of deceitful things, sneaky things. Oh, we're just like you. Oh, we have Jesus' name on the side of our building. We have all this stuff, and we're just like you. At the end of the day, they will drag you to hell with them. That's the end. They will cause you to be separated eternally from God, to be damned. And if this is really where that's at, in our society today, we can't bring a lawsuit against the guy next door who's trying to talk me into his church. It doesn't work that way. The law of the land doesn't allow us to bring a civil suit. But it isn't something, if, if they will not stop, they mean need to be killed or dead to you in your heart. That's a very, very hard thing. That doesn't mean that God can't bring them back around. But you need, you need to treat it really, really, really seriously. And what you do is basically, you, you surrender them into God's hands. Bye. I'm not going to have anything to do with you anymore. Sorry. No fellowship. We're not going there. I tried, you know, I tried to reason with you, but not, nothing going on there. Then you know what? I'm leaving it. It's between you and God. I, I've, done, I've done what I've done. But you need to be really careful because they'll get into your home and they'll mess with your children and your coworkers and, and everybody. And for me, as the pastor, the Bible's full of admonitions about watching out for wolves in sheep's clothing. And, and what we need to do, we need to take them out. And when somebody would come into this church, they're welcome to come in and hear. They're welcome to come in and learn. But when I start getting any hints that they're starting to bring their things, I, I will confront them. And if they're open to listening, I tell them, okay, well, 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 we'll keep talking together over here, but you do not bring any of that in the church. Or there's the door. That's kind of how. That's kind of how what we have to do. Um, Ten. And you shall stone him with stones until he dies, because he sought to entice you away from the Lord, Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage. So all Israel shall hear and fear, and not again do such wickedness as this among you. You know, capital punishment is a deterrent. A lot of people are like, oh, I, yeah, I, don't, I don't believe in that. You know, it's like, that, was, that wouldn't make me, uh, it would make, it makes a lot of people stop. 
what they're doing. And for the people that it doesn't make stop, they need to be stopped. You know, they're doing those things. I'm sorry, but you're, you're acting like a wild animal. Capital punishment does not stop somebody from going to heaven. If they make their peace with God, they're going to heaven. Okay? And we're all going to die, you know, in, unless we get raptured. So that's not like the end of the world that you do that. But when you have a rabid dog come onto your property and it's starting to just maim everybody, you, you got to take it out. That's what you do. Verse 12, If you hear someone in your cities which the Lord your God gives you to dwell in, saying, Corrupt men have gone out from among you and enticed the inhabitants of their city, saying, Let us go and serve other gods which you have not known. Then you shall inquire, search out, ask diligently, get your facts. Don't just hear the rumor mill and go off half-cocked. You need, to, you need to take it seriously. And if it is indeed true and certain that such an abomination was committed among you, you shall utterly strike the inhabitants of that city with the edge of the sword, utterly destroying it, all that is in it, and its livestock with the edge of the sword. And you shall gather all its plunder into the middle of the street and completely burn with fire the city and all its plunder for the Lord your God. It shall be a heap forever and it shall not be built again. So none of the accursed things shall remain in your hand, that the Lord may turn from his fierceness of his anger, and show you mercy, and have compassion on you, and multiply you, just as he swore to your fathers. Because you have listened to the voice of the Lord your God, to keep all his commandments, which I command you today, to do what is right in the eyes of the Lord your God. Why does God say this? Why does God tell you, you must do this? He wants us to know the truth. Wants you to know the truth? What would you say, Dennis? To clean things, to clear them Clean out. things up. What did we open up with today? What have we been saying since we got into this book? He loves you. He loves you. That's why he's doing this. He loves you. Amen. It's what you would do with your children. When you see that they're out running around with people that are going to take them and drag them off to hell, you cut that off. That's what Because you love them. That's what this is all about. It's about love. And yet people will read these chapters and go, whoa, that's a harsh God. It's tough love. Really? You know? There's, there's some incurable disease going around, and people are just spreading it. I, I, one of the things I hear about is AIDS and how people will... No, they have AIDS and continue going out having sex, causing other people to get AIDS. And there is no cure for AIDS. There are drugs that slow down its progress, but there's no cure. Right? And it's like, no, <laughs> that needs to stop. That's a disease. It needs to be stopped. Okay. That's what happens when I start into a chapter. And I tried to do it really fast. <laughs> chapter 14. You are the children of the Lord your God. You can highlight that in your Bible. It's a good verse to memorize. <laughs> of course, the rest of the verse is a little bit weird. You shall not cut yourselves nor shave the front of your head for the dead. Okay? <laughs> For, here's the reason why, you are a holy people. You're separate. You're not like them. You're my own peculiar people. You're, you're the apple of my eye. You're my kids. You're a holy people of the Lord your God, and the Lord has chosen you to be a people for himself, a special treasure above all peoples who are on the face of the earth. And this is, they're going into this pagan land. He says, I'm not going to wipe them all out at once. If I did, you'd be overwhelmed with all the work of trying to upkeep this land. So I'm going to drive them out piece by piece. So you're going to be living with these communities around you, and there's going to be a temptation to somehow compromise, yeah. commingle. He says, don't do that. You are going to keep pushing them out bit by bit by bit. It's going to take years, but you never stop and let them have influence over you. And one of them was their, their worship of the dead and their pagan death rituals. We've already seen they even burn their babies to their gods. They're just wicked people. And this cutting and uh, shaving and all these things 
were part of their pagan worship. We read that we are not to sorrow like others who have no hope. We know our God. We know what happens to those who we love. But we don't go off on a tear like the priest of Baal, right? In uh, 1 Kings 18, when Elijah, they have the big showdown, and they're supposed to call down fire, and they're out there dancing and going all crazy all day long. They're cutting themselves. They're bleeding. They're doing all this stuff, and God goes, not a good look. Okay, we're not going there. That's not how you worship me. That's not how we hang together. How do we hang together? Rejoice. Rejoice. Re again, I say rejoice. Love. Peace. Right? This is not the way to live. Verse 3. You shall not eat any detestable thing. These are the animals which you may eat. And it goes down and it lists the clean and the unclean animals. These are the dietary laws, okay? Um, some of these dietary laws have come to be wonderful during the bubonic plagues in medieval Europe. The Jews, because they had all of these sanitation and hygiene and dietary prescriptions, were thriving in their little enclaves, their, their communities in the cities. The word for that is ghetto. That's, that's where we get the word for ghetto. And they would be in their ghettos, and everybody's going along happy. Outside of the ghetto, people are dying like flies. Ring around the rosy, pocket full of posies, ashes, ashes, we all fall down. Except the Jews, they're doing really good. What's the deal? Well, they didn't, they didn't, they didn't buy into all of this stuff, and they were spared. Bubonic plague was spread by the fleas. That was the vector with the infected rats, and if you didn't have rats, and you kept things sanitary, and you didn't allow these kind of things going into your hygiene, your sanitation, your diet, you stay pretty good. So a lot of this is, is hygienic, or whatever, dietary, but again, don't forget that a lot of it has to do with the pagan religions of where they're going, but also God is just trying to separate them and make him his own special people. Um, I think of parents raising teenagers, it's like, you're not wearing that to school. You know, well, why? Because, because, because you're a Yost. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I don't care if the other kids are doing it. You're not going to do it. That's, that's because I love you, and I don't want to see you doing that. And, 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 and again, it's, it's a way that God can identify, and we can be identified. You know, like father, like son. There should be a family resemblance, right? And so... If you're going off and you look just like the world, hmm, not sure I'm seeing the family resemblance there, right? right? So, verse 21, You shall not eat anything that dies of itself. You may give it to the alien who is within your gates, that he may eat it, or you may sell it to a foreigner. For you are a holy people, the Lord your God. You shall not boil a young goat in its mother's milk. Okay? Um, and again, we've gone over all these things. This bit, boiling a goat in his mother's milk. Fundamentally, it's just cruel, okay, to take this baby that was just born from the mother and then take the milk, which is supposed to be nourishment for that baby, and use it as a tool to execute that animal and then gobble it all down. It's just, it's cruel. It goes against the whole heart of loving and bringing life into the world. And so now the rabbis, they convoluted this to the point that if you go to McDonald's in Jerusalem or Israel, you cannot get a cheeseburger. Because that would be dairy and beef. And they would say to you, when you eat both of those, it, it essentially boils in your stomach. And then you're, you know, doing this. Well, all these laws are not incumbent upon Christians, right? In Acts chapter 10, Peter He's, he's down by the beach, he's on the housetop, it's about lunchtime, his tummy's growling, and we read, he became very hungry in Acts 10.10, and wanted to eat, but while they made ready, he fell into a trance, and he saw heaven open, and an object like great sheet, bound at the four corners, descending to him, and let down to the earth. And it were all kinds of four-footed animals of the earth, wild beasts, creeping things, birds of the air, and a voice came to him, rise, Peter, kill, and eat. But Peter said, Not so, Lord. 
You can't say not so to the Lord. If he's your Lord, you can never say not so. Lord says it, you do it, right? But Peter is Peter. God bless him. Not so, Lord, for I've never eaten anything common or unclean. And a voice spoke to him again the second time. What God has cleansed, you must not call common. This was done three times, and the object was taken up into heaven again. And, and God was impressing upon Peter. It was actually at the end of this that there was a knock at the door and a delegation from Cornelius, uh, a Roman centurion, Gentile, was coming to ask Peter to come to his house and share the gospel. But it was against the rule for the Jews to eat non-kosher food, um, to go into the house of the Gentile, and God was fundamentally setting Peter up. I'm going to do something really cool here. Uh, yeah, you're a devout Jew. You've never done this. We're going to change it up, Peter. I'm going to cleanse all these people. Okay? So today, we're clean. Okay? Come, let's reason together. Though your sins are as scarlet, I'll make you white as snow, white as wool. Right? In uh, Second Col Colossians chapter 2, I should say, verse 16, Let no one judge you in food or in drink or regarding a festival or new moon or Sabbath. And there's so many places. Romans 14 talks about meat being sacrificed to idols and how to handle it. Paul writing to Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 4. I'll read a little bit, verses 1 through 5. Now the Spirit expressly says that in latter times, that's us, some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their own conscience seared with a hot iron. And look what they teach. Forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from foods which God created to be received with thanksgiving, thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. For every creature of God is good and nothing is to be refused if it is received with thanksgiving for it is sanctified by the word of God and prayer. So we're reading all these rules that God has set up a, a border, a fence around Israel to keep them holy, to keep them pure, to keep them undefiled, but they're binding on Israel. Um, Jesus would say, it's not what goes in a man that defiles a man, it's what comes out of a man that defiles a man. So these, these are for a special time and a special place we would call a special dispensation a special economy where God was working with the people of earth through the children of Israel to show how he can be approached and worship. And so it had to be done in a way that was respectful to God and that allowed people to know what they were doing was not like any other religion out there in the world, so to speak. Okay? Um, Verse 22, you shall truly tithe in the increase of your grain in the field that produces year by year, and you shall eat before the Lord your God in the place where he chooses to make his name abide, the tithe of your grain and your new wine and your oil, the firstborn of your herds and flocks, that you may learn to fear the Lord. I like this in this next couple of verses. But if the journey is too long for you so that you are not able to carry the tithe, and in Jesus' day they had to come from all around the world to Jerusalem, and... That's a long ways to carry your goat, right? So if it's too far, or if the place the Lord your God chooses to put his name is too far from you, when the Lord your God blessed you, then you shall exchange it for money and take the money in your hand and go to the place which the Lord your God chooses, and you shall spend that money for whatever your heart desires, for oxen or sheep, for wine or similar drink, for whatever your heart desires, you shall eat there before the Lord your God, and you shall rejoice you and your household. So this is not meant to be a burden. It's not grudging. It's not an obligation. It's an opportunity. It's a date with the Lord. It's a feast. But, man, I don't want to make this hard on you. If you're coming from Cyprus or Malta or Damascus, just bring some money. And when you get here, you can buy that offering and we'll have this wonderful feast together. No problema. Until Jesus comes into town and sees the money changers ripping off the people and turns over the table and says, "You, this is supposed to be a house of prayer. You've made it a den of thieves. It's a religious racket. It's a ripoff. Okay? But this is, this is that, how that's been set out. Verse 27, You shall not forget, 
Forsake the Levite who's within your gate, for he has no part nor inheritance with you. Don't forget the Levite. Verse 28, at the end of every third year, you shall bring the tithe of your produce of that year and store it up within your gates. And the Levite, because he has no portion or inheritance with you, and the stranger and the fatherless and the widow who are within your gates, may come and eat and be satisfied that the Lord your God may bless you in all the work of your hand which you do. So in addition to your regular tithes, there was a three-year tithe. And that was to be put in storage to provide for the widows, the orphan, the fatherless. It was part of the welfare system, including gleaning and a number of other things, even some that are going to come in just a minute here. But God's looking out for those who fall on hard times. If you go through and you add up all the tithes that are out there, Deuteronomy 14, we're going to see some in Deuteronomy 16. Back in Deuteronomy 18, there's the seven-year tithe, there's the temple taxes and all these. It's about 23% of everything that you get, you give to God. Okay? Um, but in all of that, what you're doing is you're giving it as acknowledgement that you've given me everything that I've got. I'm not even giving you anything you didn't give me. And I'm giving it to you to show you that I trust you. I don't have to worry about giving it back to you. I'm not going to go hungry. I'm not going to starve. I trust you, God. And that's why he does it. He's trying to see if you trust him, if you love him. That's what it's all about. It's opportunities for you to worship him. Chapter 15, uh, at the end of every seven years, you shall grant a release of debts. This is the Shemitah. Shemitah means release. And so it's going to go into all these things that if somebody's borrowed something or somebody has been indentured, you have to let them go at the end of seven years. Verse 2, and this is the form of the release. Every creditor who has lent anything to his neighbor shall release it. He shall not require it of his neighbor or his brother because it's called the Lord's release. Okay? You're going to get three, you're free of that debt that you've incurred. Or of a foreigner you may require it, but you shall give up your claim to what is owed to your brother. This is one of the reasons why Jewish bankers have become so wealthy in the world. Okay? Because they follow God's money laws, okay? But amongst one another, they can't charge usury or they have to cancel debts, and so they don't find themselves like maxed out on 14 credit cards. It just doesn't work in their economy. But if you're a banker, you can do that to foreign nations that don't worship God. That's how, that's the Jewish mindset, and that's why they've become known for being um, major bankers in the world today. Um, verse 4. Um, verse 3. Or a foreigner, you may require it, you shall give up your claim to what is owed your brother, except there may be no poor among you. For the Lord will greatly bless you in the land which the Lord your God is giving you to possess as an inheritance only if you carefully obey the voice of the Lord your God to observe all with care all these commandments which I command you to you today. For the Lord your God will bless you just as he promised you. You shall lend to many nations, but you shall not borrow. You shall reign over many nations, but they shall not reign over you. I mentioned the World Economic Forum earlier. And... One of the things that we have to understand, and we take these laws, again, they're meant for the Jew. They're meant for the nation of Israel. They're meant for a season in human history. They're not upon us. And yet, even America, with our Judeo-Christian values, became a lending nation to the world. Okay? Not beholden to nations. But as we have driven God and God's Word out of our society, we're seeing all of these blessings turn to curses on us, just like the Bible said. Okay? But this is kind of how it works. Verse 7. If there is among you a poor man of your brethren within any of the gates of your land which the Lord God is giving you, you shall not harden your heart nor shut up your hand from your poor brother, but you shall open your hand wide to him and willingly lend him sufficient for his need, whatever he needs. That happened to me at Walmart. I, you saw me, Daryl, there. And there was a lady and her little boy, and they were walking around with a sign, and they were hitting up everybody in the parking lot for a little money for food. Jerry, yeah, today. Okay, and so I grabbed out of my money, and I gave out of my pocket, and I gave them a little bit. You have to be convicted in your heart whether this is right or wrong. In the Philippines, we would see it all the time. 
where the Bajau, which is a people group that lives basically nomads on boats, and they go from island to island to island. They have no permanent home, but they beg, and that's how they get money. And um, they will send their children out to beg for them. And so we would see the kids coming down the street. You can identify them, and, and you know, you see them, you give them money, and they take the money and go give it to their handler. And they would never get the money, right? And they just, they're living in the streets, just sleeping on the streets. So we would try to, if we saw that happening, we'd go to a bakery real quick and get a little piece of bread and give it to the kid. And especially if it was possible, we'd get ice cream. Now, it wasn't the greatest nutritional value, but it would melt before they get to the handler. So we knew they got something out of the deal, right? Um, but one of the things we would see is you'd watch people begging on the streets. And truly, a lot of these people are, they're, it's, it's a bad place they're in. But... A real beggar will ask everybody to help. Everybody goes, help me, help me, help me, help, help me, help me, help me. But the cons, they'll just go up the street and they'll spot foreigners. They'll look for white people. They'll look for Europeans or Americans. And they will ignore everybody else. Everybody will walk by and they'll beeline to you. And then they'll go beeline to the next one, right? Because they're just shaking down the rich people. It's like, you know what? You're not desperate. If you were desperate, you'd be asking everybody for food. And we have to have a heart of compassion. I don't want to turn away somebody that's hungry. You know, when people come to the church all the time and they want something, and it's like, we give. You guys give. Out of 10% that comes in every Sunday, 10% goes into charitable giving. A portion of that goes into um, Mountain View, down on 27th Street, uh, New Hope, or Hope Christian in Paul, and the Methodist Church in Rupert, who each have uh, food a food bank, a pantry, clothing, and all that kind of stuff. So somebody comes to the church and says, I need food. I'm like, great, go to these places. We support them. We don't need to reinvent the wheel. They already do it. They do it way better than if I did it myself. So we support them in that. We send them that way. But if I see somebody that's really hungry... I'll say, man, I don't know what I've got. I'll look and see. Might have some cookies from senior study. Cookies? I need, I need more than that. Well, I'm sorry, but that's all I got, right? And, and, but we need, we need to be compassionate. Yeah, about yeah. Sorry, tangent again. Okay. Um, verse 8. But you shall open your hand wide to him, willingly lend him sufficient for his need, whatever he needs. Uh, Beware lest there be a wicked thought in your heart, saying, The seventh year, the year of release is at hand, and your eye be evil against your poor brother, and you give him nothing, and he cry out to the Lord against you, and it become a sin among you. You shall surely give to him, and your heart should not be grieved when you give to him, because for this thing the Lord your God will bless you in all your works and in all which you put your hand. For the poor will never cease from the land. Jesus said that. The poor you'll have with you always. Therefore, I command you, saying, command you, saying, you shall open your hand wide to your brother and your poor and your needy in your land. We need to be people with an open heart. And again, let the Holy Spirit be the conviction. God is interested in their heart. God is interested in their love. God is not interested in their minions just, you know, doing stuff because they're told to. It should be an act of worship. Verse 12, if your brother, a Hebrew man or a Hebrew woman, is sold to you and serves you six years, then in the seventh year you shall let him go free from you. And when you send him away free from you, you shall not let him go away empty-handed. You shall supply him liberally from your flock, from your threshing floor, from your wine press, from what the Lord has blessed you with, you shall give to him. You shall remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt, and the Lord your God redeemed you. Therefore I command you this thing today. And if it happens that he says to you, I will not go away from you because he loves you and your house, since he prospers with you, then you shall take an owl and thrust it through his ear to the door, and he shall be your servant forever. Also, your female servant, you shall do likewise. That's called a bond servant, a doulos. And basically what he's saying is, I want to be permanently attached to your home, to your house. I'm giving up or relinquishing whatever rights I am. I am a love slave, a free will slave. I do this because I love you. And so you just you nail them to the door. And, 
you know, leave them there, right? He gets to come back out. Um, but that's, that's a bond slave. We see it all the time in the New Testament. Paul, a bond servant of Jesus Christ. I've nailed myself to the house of God. That's who I serve, and I don't want to serve anybody else. Verse 18, It shall not seem hard to you when you send him away free from you, for he has been worth a double hired servant in serving you six years. Then the Lord your God will bless you in all that you do. So this is for your brother. Make sure that you send him out you know, with blessings. Verse 19, And all the firstborn males that come from your herd, your flock, you shall sanctify to the Lord your God. You shall do no work with the firstborn of your herd, nor shear the firstborn of your flock. You and your household shall eat it before the Lord your God, year by year, in the place which the Lord chooses. But if there is a defect in it, if it's lame or blind or has any serious defect, you shall not sacrifice to the Lord your God. You may eat it within your gates. The unclean and the clean person may eat it as if it were a gazelle or a deer, only you shall not eat its blood, you shall pour it on the ground like water. These firstborn gifts, right? The first thing out of the field, the firstborn, it's recognizing that you are now born again. You are a child of God. And in doing these things and giving them back to God, you're recognizing the blessing that he's given to you. That's really what that's all about. Um, i got to stop. I only made chapter 15. I really want to go to 17 tonight, so at any rate. Um, it, is, it is interesting to look at these things and be kind of refreshed and renewed in them. Um, and if you're interested in digging deeper, by all means, there's a, there's a lot a person can do to dig deeper in these. If you've got questions, ask me. Be happy to discuss things that come up in this. But do keep in mind that a great deal of what we're reading tonight was something that God established between him and Israel. And that like in the case of Peter, we are now under a new deal, a new covenant. And that in Christ we're free. And we don't have to observe all these things. What God is looking at is your heart. You still should have a generous heart. You still should have an obedient heart. You still should have a loving heart, okay? Um, and it should come spontaneously from within. Lord, I want to thank you that you have given us your son and, and forgiveness of sin and promise of eternity. You've given us your Holy Spirit, Lord. You've, you've set before us blessings and life and opportunities to worship you every day. That we... Lord, um, don't find ourselves floundering in this world, even as it grows twisted and dark. We know where you are. We know how you love us, and we know how to love you. And I pray that whatever happens around us, that we would not be moved, that we would just be resting in your grace, resting in your mercy, in your peace, your love, your joy, your hope. We're your children and nobody can snatch us out of your hand. And in that we take not only great comfort, but boldness to share that with the world in Jesus' name. Amen.